and I'm walking down towards the front and this guy stops me and he goes, hey man, I don't know you, you don't know me, but God wanted me to tell you that you're going to reach millions of people and what you're doing right now is where God is taking you. I just want to let you know that. Dude, David, so stoked to have you on, man. It's a pleasure being here, Eric. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so we met on Instagram after you heard me interview another another uh, man talking about how much they love God. Yeah. And uh, you wanted to share your story. And I thought some things that you mentioned were super fascinating. And I've wanted to have kind of themes on these interviews, on these episodes that kind of tackle a subject. And one thing that I think your story will be helpful for is talking about men and children, people growing up in broken homes. And you grew up without a father, right? Correct, yeah. He's technically still around, but I've only okay. seen him three times in my life, and that's it. Once, when I was a kid, and he came to my low-income apartment to, I guess, get to know me at like three years old. I got super excited, ran up to him, and or tried running to my mom, and he was sitting at the couch here. My mom was right here, and I was trying to go across, and he grabs me, and I freaked out because I felt terror, I felt terrified. Because I always heard story. the reason why they divorced in the first place is because he was abusive. And so I smacked him and I ran to my mom. I didn't see him all the way until 2018 when my grandpa passed away at his funeral. I did not recognize who that man was until people kept telling me, that's your dad. I was like, no one ever reached out to me. I don't care. You know, like my life is great where it is now. And then again, my brother, my brother passed away a year later, a year and a half later. And I saw him at that funeral and that's it. Never reached out, never cared. Honestly, I was for the better, but that's, that's the crazy part. I almost find it a blessing in disguise because imagine I had someone trying to insert themselves into my life that didn't care for me at all, that abused my mom, that abused my family and wanted to reach out. And so my entire life, I always, you know, had a little bit in the back of my head of, it sucks not having a dad around especially when everyone in my family, my mom has five other siblings, so I have five cousins and families. I don't know anyone from my dad's side, can care less. No one reached out to me, no one cared. Great. I grew up with a loving family around me. Grew up in a low-income family with my uh, mom, grandparents, grandma, grandpa, and older brother. All my life. And every single time I would see my parents, or my mom, and my cousins, well, their parents, I'd always look at the dad and how they treated the kids and the example that they set. And they basically raised me. Same with my grandma and grandpa. They'd raise me and my mom would be going to school. She'd be going to uh, work a, a night job to make ends meet, say clean like dental offices and things like that. Because we had just moved to the United States in the early 90s. So my family ca came around 91, 92, or it was around 92, 93. And I was born in 94. So I had actually never been to Ukraine where we came from. But as soon as we came here, my mom had me, they divorced, thankfully. So my brother always told me stories that, of things that he saw when he was very, very small. So he was three years older than me, so he got to see all that, but I never did. And so always growing up, I always had that thought in my head, like I never had the dad. And before I had the chance to let society tell me how bad it was not have one, my mom would always say, you don't have a father on heaven, uh, you don't have a father on earth that cares about you, but you have a father in heaven that is there to guide you, love you, take care of you. So no matter what, he's always there for you. When you don't have one on this earth that cares for you, he does and I do. My mom said that because she acted like both roles. She'd beat me with a belt and then give me a kiss and a cookie, you know? But that was the, the way I grew up. And it's funny because broken homes and families are all too occurring these days. And in a world where that happens often, most kids don't turn out good at all. The crazy part is my brother and I use that, use that chip on our shoulders to instead of run to drugs, instead of run away from home and end up incarcerated or whatever, the statistics of a child without a father or mother in the house, a single parent family household, is insanely high to the rate where they fail in life, become addicted, what I just mentioned. And we were one of the youngest families in our line of cousins. My mom was the second youngest. So a lot of my cousins were older than me. And 
we were the first ones, my brother was the first one to graduate with a degree in our entire family. Most of our cousins would either drop out of college or high school and get a job working for uh, a warehousing company or manufacturing company or something with their hands, but they never finished college. And it just so happens that, of course, the family that had the chip on their shoulder actually wanted it bad enough to prove everybody wrong. And that's the life that we live today. I always use that as an example of it doesn't matter what cards that you're dealt. It matters what you do with it. And with God at your back guiding you, which is always that cornerstone in my life, anything that you can dream of is possible. But don't allow your circumstances that you had as a kid destroy your future when it doesn't have to. It's all in here and it's all the enemy attacking you and telling you all these things that just because society tells you it's normal, it's really not. Everything can change. It's just a matter of how bad do you want it and who do you actually look up to as a father figure, in my case, is God. So um, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So um, I, I really appreciate that. Did your mom, was she always, like, when she was telling you that he your Heavenly Father loved you and watched out for you, did that sink in at a young age, or was it kind of a platitude? Was there a time where that ever became really real to you? It became very real to me when I was a teen. But as a kid, the school system these days is crazy it was starting to get crazy when i was growing up our biggest worry back then was them teaching evolution in school and them teaching sex ed but then it was like put a condom on a banana that was as much as it was my mom was still not cool with it so she always protected me and anytime i went to school she would preface it beforehand with hey I, they're gonna teach you that you're a monkey but when they tell you that just sit, just nod and say yes Fill out the paperwork that's required to get a good grade and move on because you are God's child. And the thing is, I always, my mom led by example. And that's what I do with my family today. She would always pray at night as a family. We would always pray together as a family. I would always remember going to church every single Sunday. Even if I was running around the church while service was going, it didn't, didn't mean I was sitting there attentive at four or five years old. I was always there. We were surrounded by that environment. My uncle was a deacon at the church we went to. We had a lot of family that went there. We always would have family events and I would there'd always be a prayer there. So we were surrounded by a Christ-centered family structure. So that was guiding. However, I never fully gave my life to Christ until I was a teenager around 17 years old. And of course, that was my step forward into actually accepting Christ like fully because I grew up, you know, understanding that I, I you know, I, I understand there's Jesus. I understand what Easter means and and what Christmas means. But until I made that decision myself, I got baptized, I believe, around 18 years old, 17 years old as well. OK, so you accepted Christ and you were 18. And then how long was it until you got married? I got married at 21. Actually, oh, so okay. I met my my wife now uh, in 2014. Mm -hmm. We did it pretty short. So we met in July of 2014. We both had, uh, uh, she had a boyfriend, I had a girlfriend at the time. We both didn't like a relationship. And my mom met her the Christmas prior at an event. And she showed me her Facebook profile at the time. And I was thinking to myself like, man, this girl's gorgeous. We're, we're both Ukrainian. So it made it easy. Because for me, I really wanted a Ukrainian wife because my grandma doesn't speak any English. And I wanted my, because I was raised by my grandma, grandpa, and mom. So that was very important to me to have similar, I was like anyone from Europe or anyone, anyone from a country where they actually have values where say traditional values, that was my big thing, you know? But of course, being able to speak Ukrainian was, was also great because my grandma is the love, is, is still, like I just was at, just saw her the other day. I love my grandma. And f that's when we met was in 2014. We got engaged in January of 2015 and then married officially in August of 2015. Cool. Crazy. That's it's awesome. Been eight years. I, eight years. Congrats, man. That's an Thank accomplishment. Um, and you have a daughter now, right? Because I've seen her. I've seen you and your kid on Instagram. How old is she? She's two and a half, almost. Two so she was born in January 2021. Dude, my youngest is now seven and I miss those days. Those are such good days, man. Yeah. I Every day, because I always hear the same exact thing. They're five, they're seven, like cherish every moment. So I tell the same thing to everyone who's about to have their firstborn. I'm like, every step of the way, 
take a picture. Like, this is how much I love my daughter. She's on my phone background, like the very first thing I see. And it probably came out really blurry, but it's on my Instagram. It's the very first post that you see. And that's the crazy thing. My family guides me and is my big reason why. The first picture that you'll see if you go to my Instagram is this I got an inspiration from a different post on like a, a man related uh, Instagram page. And it was a picture of a, a chubby guy and the next one was him holding his kid. Just completely just transformed, like really slim and fit. And I, same thing for me. When when my daughter was born, I was, I was always kind of pretty fit around that time. But during my wife's pregnancy, I kind of was not paying attention to my diet, wasn't working out, and it was all over the place. And so there's pictures of me holding her as a newborn with a bunch of extra love handle fat and belly fat and everything and just kind of pudgy. And I was like, oh, this is disgusting, like looking back at it. But then me now, totally different person, I made myself better in every single way. And then we were in Miami in February and I have that picture of me holding her up just just muscles, just beautiful. She's getting bigger now. And it's just the, what my daughter did to my life, that I'm doing everything for her and her future children and my wife, just being the best man that I can be, lead spiritually, lead the family, be the provider and show other men the way that I believe life should be, you know, be there for your family, provide traditional values, all of that. Dude, that's awesome. It's that's honorable. I'm I'm kind of on the same journey right now. Um, I'm now working out every morning at 5 a.m. I just did a marathon and uh, fixing my diet and just uh, it, it, it. There's something about when you when you do when you uh, improve one area of your life, the rest follows suit. It just has to happen. And when something's lagging, whether you're spiritually sick, physically sick from neglect. It pulls everything down. I mean, it, it's all body, mind, soul. I'm just learning. It's all connected, and they all need to be, they all need to be cared for, and kept, and held, and honored. So I, I really respect what you're doing. In fact, you're you're now helping other men overcome addictions, get getting fit. Like, what what are you doing? It's called the Lion's Tribe. Is that correct? Yeah, and in honor of that, my wife got me the lion behind me for my birthday two months ago. <laughs> cool. That's awesome. Because I was always thinking about you know, what guides me the most. And I love lions. I've always loved lions. And, and I look back at towels that we would buy as kids. My brother had a wolf and I would always have the lion towel. That would be my thing. And I love cats and obviously big cats. And for me, the whole preface of the lion's tribe and why I call it that is, is I want people, men, to develop the lion's mentality so that they wake up every day hungry. A lion wakes up hungry every single day. He doesn't have a win from last week or a gazelle he tackled or the lioness is tackled and left it in a refrigerator somewhere to eat. No, every day he wakes up hungry, every day he's on the hunt. When there is a big obstacle, say they want to hunt down a elephant, do they do it alone? No, they gather the rest of the lions and lionesses and they tackle the elephant. There's so many videos that I've watched of just one, one lion attack an elephant, they couldn't do it. But then when all of them come, that's when it's that's when they're able to do big things mm -hmm. and where i am in life i was never able to fully do things on my own i always had a mentor in my life i always had someone to guide me right with church you have pastors leaders accountability partners all of that doing it alone is where the devil loves to work always and so most people it's easy to go hey buddy you're a bit overweight you should lose weight then they go why does that even matter like i feel okay like I'm not, I'm not that guy. And they point to a 500 pound guy. Like they go, I'm not that guy. Well, yeah, but you are 40, 50 pounds overweight. You're feeling sluggish. You're not as confident. You, you don't feel as good. And it shows in your work. It shows how you show up. When you go to the beach, you don't want to take your shirt off. That was all me. I wasn't 40 pounds overweight, but I was still 20 pounds overweight. And I just still, I didn't like taking my shirt off because I, when I was 17, I looked really, really good. And then when I'm 26 years old, I look back at pictures from when I was in Greece we talked about back then I was making a lot of money in affiliate marketing and I let myself go and it was very apparent it's like I can tell everyone how how I'm successful and doing all these things but behind the scenes I was eating I wasn't paying attention to my working out and then one big deep dark thing everyone loves to hide a skeleton in their closet for some it's alcohol some it's drugs some 
it's addiction to video games. For me, I kind of had, occasionally I drink alcohol, but I hated it because I would always feel terrible afterwards. Um, weed, I hated it because it was just, it, not for me. I never went further than that ever, thank the Lord. Um, video games, I was addicted when I was 16 years old to that. It doesn't really have a hold on me at all, but it did back then. You know, one of the guys I coach now was telling me that just recently stopped because he joined my group. And for him, the pain point was video games have such a hold on people because of the dopamine hit and you want to live in that environment. And so he would cancel events with friends. He would not show up to his, to his uh, job as much. And everything was kind of downhill. He would yelled at his girlfriend for wanting to go out to have dinner because he wanted to play this game. Well, for me, my deep, dark thing that I had in the closet that no one knew about, I mean, guys always talk about it, was porn. That, I was introduced around 11, 12 years old by friends in my neighborhood. And just everyone who's a kid wants to grab the, the magazine. Or I grew up in the era where computers and internet started becoming a thing. So I remember dial-up internet and all that. Uh, as soon as we got a non-required DSL where you can actually go on the internet without having to have a home phone hooked up, that was game over, you know, for my brother, for me, for for millions and millions and millions of men across the world and women now. It's getting worse and worse and worse. The problem with porn is it's a huge dopamine release, the same you would get from video games or other vices like that. But what it does is not the the moral thing. It's not that's someone's daughter. That doesn't work if you if if you think about it that way. If you are the way that I look at a lot of this stuff is I struggled with it and everyone would say think about what you're doing as if it was your daughter. Think about it as if that person was in slavery. Think about it as if it's hurting God. Think about it as if it's hurting someone else. And you're like, I don't care. You are just trying to get your fix because for some odd reason, I convinced myself that that was just something that would make me happier. It would be something that would, I was just kind of, that was my thing. I was a very sexual, sexualized kid because of what I was exposed to. And I was always a little bit of a player as a, as a kid. I actually never had sex until I was married, thank the Lord. But I did everything in between, you know? So like, what do you really consider that? However, imagine being married for five years, six years. Your wife has no idea that that's your problem because now it's as accessible as Instagram. It's as accessible on your phone. You walk into the bathroom, go to the bathroom real quick, how long does it really take a guy to, to, to get his fix? Not long, not long. And every time it destroys you more and more and more and more. It destroys you morally, but it also destroys your loved ones. It destroys your wife. Like I never realized this, but say me and the wife got in an argument. I would run, I would just ignore her and then I'd go run to porn every so often and spite in a way. Like, you know, I'm gonna withhold being with her, not even thinking about it. And then we we would go like a month, no sex, no intimacy, no nothing, right? As a young guy, I mean, look, like I am attractive and she's very attractive. So what? Why? Why is that? Part partially because of the porn. Other partially is because I was I've just been in, a, in a, an addiction to also working a lot. So it's like working, porn, and my wife goes on the side. And so I thought that getting the pastor to talk to you would help. Well, that helps for a, a day until the next day the devil tempts you, whispers in your ear, and then you feel helpless and you go, oh, I guess she did leave. And then you see all these movies about joking about porn and all these random articles saying it's healthy to do this, it's healthy to do that. So you go find every single reason to say this is okay, right? That's what we all do, we, we rationalize, right? The alcoholic is the same thing. They go, Nothing's really bad about it. Everyone drinks when you go out to an event or, you know, someone comes over, hey, you want, you want, you want, want a shot of whiskey, you want this, you want that, because it's, it's polite. Like, I would have Russians and Ukrainians over for like a Thanksgiving, they'd have like a shot of cognac or whatever. It was a ritual thing. And so, for me, I had a lot of breaking points, but around, I think it was 19 or 20, I remember it was my late teens, before I was even married, I prayed to God, I said, God, I will give you everything in my life, but can I just have this? 
in tears because I couldn't help myself and I couldn't run to anybody. I couldn't tell my mom. I couldn't tell my brother, even though we both did it without, you know, without communicating. Cause it's a, it's boys do it. Like I, it's very rare to find someone that doesn't have that problem. I was just talking to a friend of mine earlier today and he's free of it for over a year now as well. But it, it, but being married and having that addiction is crazy. And then having a daughter, you don't even think about it. It worked for six months going, ah, I got a, I got a daughter. I'm a better man than that. Until you're alone, until you're bored. Boredom leads to a, vices, which leads to addictions, which leads to a pit of sorrow that you can't get out of. So that's what most men are at. They will get bored. And when you're bored, the devil likes to tempt you. Just like when Jesus was out in the desert and the devil tempted him with everything. Riches, look at the castles, everything because he was deprived of food. And he's like, here's some bread. Here's all this. We can give it all to you. Right? And he does the same thing over and over and over again. It can be porn. It can be food. It can be sleeping in. It can be failing your family by not getting a, that promotion at work and helping your family out of poverty. It's all these things. It's anything the devil can take to bring you down a level. That's what he will use. I didn't really, it didn't really quite resonate. I, it's been a year now and I have not watched porn once. If anything like that has come up, it has been a random flash of something on the computer or a random flash of something on Instagram. And I go unfollow page, get rid of you. I don't care. Devil's trying again. Nope. I don't care. Dude, it's so frustrating how pernicious it, pernicious it is. Like, yeah. it, it just like, like people like Instagram. There'll be accounts. You're like, oh my gosh, why is this even here? I mean, it's like you have to be so diligent and so aware. And and I love so much that you talked about a lion. Yeah. Wakes up hungry, dude. Yeah. That is that is the truth. And one of the things I'm studying right now is C.S. Lewis says you need to start the day with God as if nothing has happened. Yeah. Like you have to start fresh every single day. We go to bed, like you might've had the spirit the past day. You go to bed, it's a reset. You yeah. have to wake up and you have to pray. You've got to read scriptures. You got to have purpose. And I want to know what you, what you teach in your experience, but this is my experience is you have to fill your well immediately to have the armor of God, to have, to have the I day with God. I love that analogy. Put on the armor of Christ every single day. Yeah. Right. But it has to start every day and you can't, you literally cannot use what happened yesterday you can't just like you said you talked to your pastor it might have worked for a day like that motivation or that encourage it worked for a day great but maybe the next morning you didn't say your prayers or you weren't intentional about who you were going to serve that day so now i want to know yeah you've explained the problem and so many men deal with this and um breaking breaking free is amazing You're, you you just feel so much better i want to know how, what you teach and, and your experience on how you got out of it this is, this is the one thing, just like you said, every day you wake up hungry. The hunger will drive you to do good things or do bad things, right? Mm -hmm. Just like the devil will find you at any moment and tempt you with something. There is a book called Outwitting the Devil that got released in the last 10 years or so. Cool. But it's a very interesting book because it's by Napoleon Hill and it, whether or not it's completely real or not, the story comes down to a lot of what it says is the devil does not care what the sin or problem is. He wants to bring you down. So for me, it was porn. For others, it's overeating. Mm -hmm. For others, it's alcohol. For others, it's video games. For, it doesn't matter. There will always be an attack. And until you can become so disciplined, so dialed into your purpose, your goal, your reason, who you are in Christ, that is where change is made. Dude, I love that. You, the scripture came to mind uh, when Christ tells Peter, when you are converted, strengthen thy brethren. I'm just really impressed, man. I'm, I'm so excited to see like in 10 years what you've built, what the what the lion's tribe will look like then. You know, I don't think I don't think we can imagine how good it'll be, but you're obviously doing God's will. When someone would ask me, five years, where do you see yourself? And I go, you know, I actually have no idea. Like, like I said, like affiliate marketing, if they, um, I changed one thing. I got to rethink my entire world. And I didn't know where my future was. Like, what, what am I to do with this world? And this is it. When someone says, where are you in 10 years? I say, I am on stage with the masses helping 
hundreds of thousands of people and hopefully millions. And why I just got a bit emotional is that um, I actually, God has told, spoken this to me through multiple pastors and people before in the in this last six months since I started and especially in the last couple of months. Um, Cause I started this in October. Now that when I said, when you heal yourself and you know what you healed yourself, then you can heal others. And I'm walking down towards the front and this guy stops me and he goes, Hey man, I don't know you, you don't know me, but God wanted me to tell you that you're gonna reach millions of people and what you're doing right now is where God is taking you. I just wanna let you know that. And I mean, I got goosebumps right now thinking about it again and I welled up and then I go down to the front and the pastor is like praying for one person at a time and but then he skips over me because someone got in front of me and in my head it was like, devil was like, hey, just go back. It's getting late. Every excuse not to stay. And then the and then I'm like looking down and I'm just like, you know what? Whatever. I'm about to give up. And then the pastor blows up wind on my face. He puts his hand and starts praying over me very quietly. But my wife actually took a video because she knew that this was this last little thing that was finally getting on my system. And I'm like bawling forward. And then all of a sudden, he blows on me again after he finished praying for me. And then my hands dropped. And then the pastor behind me um, starts praying for me verbally, and he's telling me these things. So my grandpa passed away in 2018, and he's praying for me. He's like, your your grandpa's uh, watching over you. He's proud of you. You are going to be the one who, in this family, is going to transform lives. He is proud of you. Your brother's proud of you. And I was like, this man doesn't know who I am. And then I start bawling again, bawling again, bawling again. And then it became clear to me what my mission in life was. So when you said 10 years down, I truly believe that I'm going to reach hundreds and thousands of people with my message of overcoming with, I was born in a low income family without a dad and everyone laughed at me. I had my aunts and uncles would laugh at me in the middle of camp because my brother was overweight. We wouldn't, they would always tell us what we weren't. I, there'd always be something in there and I always be like there's a chip on my shoulder like I need to prove something at some point and I I look back now at my upbringing and I go this is exactly the story that I need to help others everything to my life up to this point is in service to others and what God is creating here is bigger than me and that's how I know like by the end of the year I pray to God that I reach enough people to the point where I don't have to work in my affiliate marketing business and I can spend every waking moment of my life getting on conversations like we're having right now, spreading my word out, going to speaking engagements and helping others, meeting people. There's a guy at my gym that's on my program now. He just started going there for a week. I told you I have these random, um, these like pushes and nudges by God. He was very depressed. He's in the middle of a divorce with his wife. He's got two kids. He's around my age. I said hi to him. We talked about working out a little bit. Did that for a few days that week, off and on when I'd see him. And then I asked him his story in the locker room. He told me his story. I gave him my, my name, because he asked also, I always have a tripod with me at the gym recording a little bit of a workout. And then we talked, and then he said all the pain he was in. And then I gave him my, my YouTube, which it's everything on my Instagram, it kind of gets ported over there in those short clips. And he came back to me, he's like, that I, I feel so much better and transformed. Like, I'd love to be coached by you, but I can't, af I can't afford it. And I was like, listen, you don't have to afford it right now, but when the time is here and it's on your heart to fully change and, and be on this mission and becoming the better version of yourself where I can make you feel better, look better, act better, and help you with your family's business and help you grow and get over this big hump in your life. We talked, he understood it, he came back to me, says, I'm ready. And now, he was just, I have, I have a private group where we talk, and he was just telling me, it's been over a week, no more alcohol, he feels so much better, he's now waking up at 5 a.m. Every morning he checks in, we all check in in the morning, we wake up, boom, I'm up, boom, I'm up. Hey, I got this injury on my shoulder, but I'm still gonna work out, what should, what should I do? Like, that, helping people get better, overcome, drop all of your, uh, most people have such a, high view of themselves, especially on the internet, like I don't need help from some random guy. Yes, you do. We all have something that we need to advance on. Like if you were to come to me 
two years ago and tell me I can make you better. I'm like, buddy, buddy, I'm good. I'm about to have a kid. I have a business. I'm pretty fit. Like, leave me alone. But we all have room to get better, which is my journey in 75 hard. I knew something had to change. So then my question to the audience, anyone who listens to this is, what is that thing that you're hiding that you need help with? What is that thing that is stopping you from being the best version of yourself? Giving your all to your family, giving your all to your craft, to your business, to your loved ones. What is that thing? Because from where I've been and what I've resolved, I can help you because I've been through the fire and Christ guiding me, I can help others do the same. And that is my message and that is how I can help people 10 years down the line and why that's so much emotion behind that. Because God has showed me where I'm going in the future and I cannot wait for this journey. Dude, I can't wait for it either. Dude, you're a very effective teacher because you have lived it and you've walked it and you're not just preaching from, um, you know, I just hate like, that. I hate like, that stuff. You're, you're not just Everybody preaching from like, friends. yeah, they just sit there and they just go, you gotta be disciplined because of this, 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 this. I read this book. This is—it's just like you're not just sharing cultural wisdom. You're sharing your personal wisdom uh, of you being healed through God, and you are—you're throwing all the praise to God. That's why—that's why you'll be successful. It's—it's it's not you building yourself up. You're building men up and giving praise to God. So, man, I'm—I'm I'm so grateful you were able to share this. Are there any final thoughts that you'd want to wrap with before we before we end this? Man, that last bit was my final thought. But I, 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 I thought so too. I just didn't want to make, hey, I wanted to make sure there's no. nothing else. It was so there, good. We can go for five hours and I will not yeah. stop talking because there is so much that I want to dig deep into. But of course, this is specific to what? To men being the best version of themselves through Christ to be the best version of themselves so that they can be, be a provider for their family, so that they can love their wives, so that they don't leave their family, that they stay, but they love. I didn't have that, but I'm going to be that. That is my mission, is to be the father and the inspiration for my family and the role model. My daughter, there's a video I just posted. She is so obsessed with me and my wife because we're always home that we, we just post a little video. She loves working out with daddy. We're both doing little squats in the bedroom and I go down, she goes down, I go up, we go up. To be that role model, that is what it's all about, to be fully present and know that I don't have anything in my closet that's hiding. There's nothing. You can go through my entire life, nothing will surprise anybody anymore because it's all out there. And being free, truly free, not, being, not putting up a wall like everyone does online, but humbling yourself to be teachable, to say, I've had enough with the alcohol, I've had enough with the porn, I've had enough with the drugs, I've had enough of mediocrity and failing my family by not being in the best shape of my life, by not being financially successful enough to take care of my family and not being in church, not being the spiritual leader of the family. You need to knock all of those out and be the best man that you can be and wake up every single day, get rid of the old you. That is not you. The one that is left is the one that is your vision and your goal in life. And you can step into that man today. The question is, when will you? Your time can start right now. You can be free right now. Through Christ, you can be free right now. But you have to want to do it, right? It's that, that is it. It's that pride, man. That's the, yeah. it's the hardest one. Pride, that's why pride's the worst sin. Keeps you from all the goodness. Uh, okay. What a month we're in then, eh? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so if anyone out there is uh, wanting to change and and uh, having that their heart being pricked, I, I want, I encourage you to reach out to David, someone who's walked through it and is open and, uh, and, and knows what it's like. So David, where can people find you? Yeah, primarily Instagram. I kind of made myself spread out everywhere except for TikTok. Uh, it's at David Fishchuck. It's D-A-V-I-D-F-I-S-H-C-H-U-K. Basically everywhere. Um, on Instagram primarily is where I kind of start and source everything out to say like Facebook, it's the same stuff. And then in, uh, YouTube, same stuff. But as we grow, there'll be more stuff on YouTube as longer form stuff comes out. But that's cool. Shoot me a message on there. Let me know what you got going on, how I can help you become a better man, drop the vices, the addictions, and get in the best shape of your life mentally, physically, spiritually, financially, all the way around in life.
That's awesome, man. Okay, I'll make sure to link in our in our show notes. But David, I love you, brother. I'm so glad you could come on. This has been rad. So Appreciate thank you. Eric. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this episode. More importantly, I hope you feel closer to your creator. If you find yourself wanting to strengthen your relationship with God, I'm a huge fan of the Skylight app. It's full of beautiful, high quality daily spiritual practices. Finally, never forget, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him.